If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm number 111. Psalm 111, we'll get there in just a moment. The primary reason as to why our society is on such a frightening and swift decline, morally and obviously religiously speaking, is due to a lack of, in my opinion, a lack of respect, lack of reverence, and a lack of awe for the God of heaven. You look at all that is around us, the refusal of men, of foolish men, to recognize the existence of God. You think one of the, you think one of the major atheist organizations today is the freedom, they want freedom from religion. The Bible describes these kind of people thusly in Psalm 14, in verse number 1. The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. But yet that's how so many people are acting and behaving today as fools, failing to recognize the very existence of the God of heaven, Jehovah God, the Almighty God, the Eternal God. Then there are the efforts to remove every vestige of God and His Word from our society. Think about 50, 60 years ago when there was prayer in schools, when there was respect for the Word of God, for God Himself. And you think about, and you think about how better off our society was then. But nowadays, you even mention God and you offend people. Then we have the efforts of man to redefine what is right and good and wrong and evil. Man today says, for example, that homosexuality is natural. That's a redefinition of what God has defined as sin, is it not? This is a doctrine known as moral relativism. That is, what may be fine for one may not be for another. Truth is relative to these individuals. Certainly, however, what we're seeing today is not new. Go back to the days of Isaiah, Isaiah 5 verse 20. There was a woe pronounced upon them, those in, the, in Judah who called good evil and evil good. We're seeing the same thing today, are we not? Then we see blasphemy of God, and certainly this includes all three members of the Godhead. It's rampant in our society with the words that we speak, the music that we hear, the movies, our entertainment industry. You remember back some 26, 25 years ago, the movie, The Last Temptation of Christ? I was too little to remember it, but from what I've read, from what some brethren who reviewed it back then, reading older articles, that, was, that movie was nothing more than pure blasphemy. They had Jesus while on the cross thinking, correct me if I'm wrong, Brother John, thinking lustful thoughts about Mary. That's blasphemy. Man attempting to raise himself up as his own God, humanism. Men's refusal to obey God's holy will. Man's perverting his word, adding to his word, or taking away, and the list could go on and on. There is a lack of respect for the God of heaven. Why should we, why must mankind show reverence for God? Consider who God is. Let's look at the back half of Psalm number 111 and verse number 9, where we are told that holy and reverend is his name. So why should we be in awe of God? Why should we respect God? Why should we reverence God? Number one, because of who he is. He is God. Because of what he is like. He is a holy God. He is a just God. He is also a loving God, a God of great grace and mercy, but he's also a severe God. Romans 11, verse number 22. But also because of his name, it is holy and reverend. You think mankind shows God reverence today when he applies this appellation religiously to him himself? How many, you drive down, you drive throughout the community, you could drive throughout any community in the land. How many times will you see on, on various churches billboards signs saying reverend so and so? Man has not the right to call himself reverend. 
Only God has that right because only the name of God is holy and reverend. When man applies that title to himself, he is showing a lack of respect, a lack of reverence for God. The word translated reverend here is from the Hebrew word yare, which is to fear, to stand in awe of, to be awed, reverence, to honor, to respect, to be held in awe, to inspire reverence or godly fear, according to Brown, Driver, and Briggs in their Hebrew lexicon. But obviously, fourthly, why should we reverence God? Because according to verse number 10, it's the only wise thing to do. Notice here, it tells us, the psalmist tells us, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now you go to the book of Proverbs and you will see this exact same statement made. That's where wisdom begins, is it not? It's by fearing God. However, we need to understand that reverence is not just something that just happens. It doesn't just pop up out of the blue. It, it, it's something that must be taught, and, we, and it must be taught at an early age. We teach our children, do we not, to, to love God, to obey God? And in so doing, we teach them to reverence God. And certainly we see this throughout the Old Testament in regards to God's instructions to Israel. And of course, Romans 15, 4, that these things were written for our learning. And Deuteronomy 4, verse number 10, and also chapter 17, Israel was exhorted to hear God's instruction. Well, why is that? Well, so that they would learn to fear God. They had to be taught. They had to learn. And then, of course, it's up to us to make the proper application. In Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12, we're told that fear of God was a requirement for Israel to be blessed of God. And certainly, the same holds true today. If we're going to be pleasing to God, we must fear God. When we reverence God, we will submit to Him, and we're going to demonstrate that here in our lesson tonight. But also Psalm 34, in verse number 11, the psalmist writes that the people of God are to teach, teach what? The fear of the Lord. Because reverence is something that must be taught, and because there is a lack of reverence for God in our society, there is an urgent need for us as His children and for all men to be reminded of why it is that all must fear, that is, reverence God. And that's what we're going to be talking about when we mention the word fear, is reverence, respect for God. And so tonight, as we continue in our study of the Godhead, and as we think about our attitude as mankind, as humans, towards God, we want to look at this thought of reverence for the Godhead or fearing God. In this lesson, we're going to examine the importance of such by way of coming to a better understanding of what it means to revere or to fear God. We're going to look at the fact that it is demanded by God for man to fear or to reverence Him. We're going to look at biblical examples of those who reverence God, who feared God, how we manifest this disposition in our lives, and then ultimately we're going to note some rewards that come to those who do revere or fear God. And indeed, it is very rewarding. There are blessings that come when we show respect for God. And we're going to demonstrate in our lesson that reverence or fear of God ultimately leads us to obey and serve God joyfully and faithfully. But a lack thereof leads to disrespect for God and ultimately rejection of God and His will for one's life. And so, first of all tonight, I want us to come to an understanding of what it means to reverence God or to fear Him. When we think about our English term, Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines it as honor or respect that is felt or shown to someone or something. That is the English usage. However, when you come to the old, however, when we come to the Bible, it's a little bit different story. Fear is used in a variety of ways. When you study the Old Testament, there's nine different Hebrew words translated fear, and, and they, convey, they are used in a variety of ways, such as dread, terror, horror. But they're also used in the meaning of reverence, respect, honor, or awe. The idea of honor or reverence or respect toward power and authority. So understanding that, basically we need to understand as well that fear is used in two distinct senses. There is the negative sense, Revelation 21, verse 8, 
um, couched among that list of those who are going to be cast into the lake of fire are those who are fearful. The idea of fear there is the idea of coward, coward, cowardly, cowardice, just tread, de- tre- terror, dread that keeps one from doing what they know they need to do. It's also used negatively in 1 John 4, 16 through 18, where John sums it up, that perfect or complete love casteth out fear. But on the other hand, though, there's the positive sense, where it's used the idea of reverence or respect in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. And we're very familiar with that verse, where Solomon, in bringing the matter to the conclusion, says, Fear God and keep his commandments. Well, why is that? For this is the whole duty. Now, the word duty there is supplied. Literally, he is saying, for this is the whole of man. The whole of man consists of fearing God, and that fear of God leads him to keep his commandments. Those two things are joined together by God. If we fear him, we're going to keep his commandments. But if we don't fear him or reverence him, we're not going to keep his commandments. Fear of the Lord is the theme when we think about it tonight. And literally, it's from a phrase I found in Jensenius' Hebrew lexicon, Yeroth Yehovah which Jensenius defines as reverence, or, simply put, holy fear. And certainly this phrase is used here in Psalm 111.10, as well as throughout the book of Proverbs. Now, understanding this, we need to understand what fear is not as it relates to God. When we think about this, God... It's not a cowering before God as if he is some abusive parent. You know, kids, you know, when you hate to see kids with abusive parents, but you see kids in abusive homes, and when their parents come in, they're just cowering in dread because they're afraid of what their parents are going to do to them. They're afraid they're going to be treated badly. And And this is not how God acts. We should not cower before God as if he is some abusive parent, nor should we be afraid of God as if he is toying with us and playing with us and then ultimately just snuffing us out or or casting aside. You see, if this is the concept we have in regards to our relationship with God as Christians, we need to rethink some things. Notice Christ's words in Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 7, and context of the Sermon on the Mount here. He's dealing with the principle of asking, seeking, asking, knocking, and asking, seeking, knocking. And he begins in verse number seven, to ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now notice verse number nine. Here's the points I want us to get to. Or what man is there of you whom, if his son asks bread, will, will he give him a stone? Is that what a father would do to his child? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a ser- serpent, that is, a snake? I don't think any father would do that to their children. Well, maybe some of the most deadbeat dads would, but not loving fathers. Note verse 11, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children... How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? We respect God, but we shouldn't cower before Him in in this sense because what He will do for us if we reverence Him and do His will is bless us abundantly. Yes, fear is reverence, but in a sense it carries with it a certain confidence as His people that he will do what he says and will fulfill his promises. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Remember remember the statement made there? It's also quoted from Joshua chapter 1. God tells his people, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now note verse 6. What the Hebrews writer said there. For the Lord is my helper, and I shall not fear anything that man does to me. Paraphrasing. Notice that. Notice the confidence in those words. That's the confidence we can have in God as His, as his people if we tr- if, when we show this reverence for Him. Because this is what we are dealing with. It is a deep respect and love for God 
It is a desire to do that which is pleasing in his sight. And certainly we see this on the part of Cornelius, do we not, in Acts chapter 10? Acts 10 teaches us the principle that those who truly fear or reverence God and thus work righteousness, that is, do right, that is, obey God and keep his commandments, are those who are accepted by him. Where does our obedience begin? It begins with fearing God, showing him the proper respect that he deserves because he demands it. God demands our reverence. Certainly we see this in, in two basic passages in the Old, and we'll get to that on the slide here in just a moment. We've already mentioned Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and the new basic passage is 1 Peter 2, 17. Both times the phrase fear God is used. It's that important. When we fear God, obviously we must reverence each member of the Godhead. Not only we, we must show reverence for the Father. Christ said in John 15, verse 23, that if we hate Him, we hate the Father. On the other hand, if we love and honor the Christ, we love, honor the Father. Well, how do we show love and honor to Christ? By submitting to His will. When we submit to Him, what are we, who else are we submitting to? The Father. Also notice the discipline that God the Father offers to his children and how we should respond in Hebrews chapter 12 beginning with verse number 5. When the Hebrews writer says, Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor despise not, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth, dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom he, the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye Ill illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? You see, we show re respect, honor to our earthly fathers. How much more so should we toward the heavenly Father? But also there should be that for the Son. Think about the parable of the wicked husbandman in Matthew chapter 21. Here we have a picture of the Jewish rejection, irreverence for, for God, for His servants who were the pro prophets, the preached message they, they brought, and ultimately the Christ. Notice especially there in verse 37 of Matthew 21. Where the, the owner of the vineyard, the representative of the father, said, They will reverence my son. But ultimately, verses 38 and 39, did they reverence him? No. What did they do? They had him put to death. They showed despisement for the Christ. And certainly when you study that parable in its entirety, you will find that the Jewish religious leaders ultimately came to the conclusion, he's talking about us. Many, both within the Lord's church, those of us as Christians, obviously those without, do not reverence Christ. Think about Hebrews 10 verse 29. Many are the people who count his blood as something that is to be trodden underfoot. How disgraceful is that? Is to treat the precious blood of the Lamb as something to just walk all over. To just wipe your shoes on. However, we're going to be brought into judgment one day if we do that. John 14, 15 is, the is how we demonstrate reverence for Christ. If you love me, keep my commandments. But then we also show reverence for the Spirit. Well, what, And how do we do that? Well, one way is by respecting the word that he brought down. Holy men of old were guided, spake all truth as they were guided or borne along by the Holy Spirit as Peter talked about in 1 Peter 1, 19 through 21. In Psalm 119, verse 161, the psalmist said that my heart standeth in awe of thy word. This book is something to be respected, is it not? Because it is the very word of God. We need to stand in awe of that word. And we need to submit our lives to that word. But sadly, as we all understand, the majority of people do not stand in awe of God's word, nor will they submit their lives to his word. So understanding this, however, 
we look throughout the Bible and we find that God's demand for reverence has been demonstrated practically for us. Let me give you four examples. Number one, Noah. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, we're told that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, how did he do that? By submitting himself to God, by doing his will. But notice in particular Hebrews 11 and verse 7. It is by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen as yet. Well, what? The flood that was going to come. So what did Noah do? He moved. Well, how did he move? He moved with fear, godly fear. And what did he do? What did his godly fear move him to do? He prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Noah respected God's will. Noah feared God. And he believed God's promise that he was going to destroy the earth with a flood. And certainly that is demonstrated by his faith in doing what God instructed him to do. Abraham is another individual who reverenced God. Genesis 22. We're very familiar with the context. God told Abraham to go sacrifice his only begotten son Isaac. And we're very familiar with the situation. Abraham had Isaac tied down up there on Mount Moriah. He had him all prepared for the sacrifice. He had the knife in his hand. And he was on the downward plunge. And what happened? The angel of the Lord stayed his hand. Notice what it said in verse 12. Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou, that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. Abraham showed great fear for God, reverence in doing his will. And, it, and that's, where, that's where the rubber hits the road, is it not? This is how we live faithful to God. This is how we please God, is it not? Begins by, how we, by our attitude toward him. If we respect God, if we respect his will for our lives, we're going to do like Noah and Abraham did. We're going to comply with God's will. Then you think about Job. In Job chapter 1 and verse 8. You think about what his fear of God did. It enabled him to endure his horrible sufferings. I don't think there's anyone this side of Christ. Christ suffered more than Job, obviously, but outside of Christ, there is not one biblical character. There is not one individual who suffered more loss than Job. He suffered the loss of family. He suffered the loss of wealth. He suffered the loss of, of health. And yet he did, would not curse God. You think about what happened when he came out on the other side of his sufferings. He was blessed even more so by God than before. What got him through it? His reverence for God. His respect. His fear of God. Even when his wife told him to curse God and die, he refused. He was in a difficult situation. But yet he would not give up on God. That's how much he respected. That's how much he honored God. That's how much he feared God. Then in the New Testament, we're told about Cornelius. And we're very familiar with this man, a devout man. Acts 10, 1 and 2. We're told that he feared God. What did his fear of God lead him and his household to do? Become Christians. He sent for the preacher, Peter. He heard what he needed to do and they responded to the gospel. They were baptized into Christ. That's the importance of reverence, is it not? But then how do we manifest it in our lives practically? Well, obviously by obeying God. Remember what Christ said in Luke 6, 46? Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? How many people living today try to give honor to God with their lips, but their hearts are far from Him? Are they truly reverencing God? Well, why are they not? Because they're only giving Him lip service. They've not submitted themselves, or they're not submitting themselves to His will. We must obey God. We must serve God. Notice Joshua 24, verse 14. When Joshua exhorted Israel... And I put it on the previous point, but it could fit on either point. For, for per 
He exhorted Israel, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. If we truly love God, if we're truly going to serve him, we're going to obey him and that involves putting away sin. When we put away sin, when we die to sin as a Christian, we must serve him faithfully. Hebrews 12, 28, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. That's how we serve God. Our reverence for God is manifested in how we live and living a life that is pleasing to God. If you be risen with Christ, set your affections on things which are above. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Not on things on the earth. Paul's perspective was for me to live as Christ. And that should be our motto as well as children of God today. If we truly love God, if we truly honor Him, our lives are going to be conformed to His will. That's how we manifest it. Our worship to God today, John 4, 24, demonstrates reverence. Again, as I pointed out this morning in, in our thoughts prior to observing the Lord's Supper, in spirit, the idea of spirit there indicates our disposition. Should not our worship to God be done in a reverent manner? Should we not be reverent in our worship to God, every aspect of it, whether, we, it, whether it is the preaching, to hearing of His Word, whether it is when we observe the Lord's Supper, whether it is a giving of our means, prayer to God or singing praise unto God, should not every single act of our worship to God be done reverently, with a sense of awe, knowing that we have the privilege of being able to worship God acceptably as His children. Our worship to God must be done reverently. Also, a final point in regards to this, when we put God first in our lives, we're showing reverence for Him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That should be the goal of every single individual living today, should it not? Seeking first God's kingdom. How do we know we truly love God and that we truly respect and honor Him and revere Him? By seeking first His will for our lives. By putting first things first. Putting ourselves in the proper place in life. There's the acronym, J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, and yourself last our priorities speak to us of whether we revere God or not now having said all that we need to understand that if we truly show reverence to God we are going to be rewarded Psalm number 112 teaches us that and we're also going to tie in with material from that particular psalm some passages from the Proverbs now we're not going to take the time to read this psalm it's ten verses, but we are going to bring out some points. I encourage you in your spare time at home and doing personal Bible study to read this in connection with verses 9 and 10 of Psalm number 111. And the theme of this psalm is regarding the man who fears God, which ties back in with Psalm 111 in, in verse number 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of, beginning of wisdom, and certainly this deals with a wise man. You see, if we, fear, if we fear God, if we revere God, we're going to have true happiness. Notice verse 1. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. It's in the form of a beatitude. Where is true happiness to be found? In God, in Christ. Who are those who are happy? God's children. Well, why is that? Why, why are we so happy? Why, why does this produce true happiness? Because it produces stability of life. In verse num latter portion of verse number 1, we delight greatly in His commandments. Also, verses 6 through 8, and I didn't put them on the slide, also, also deal with this. Where it talks about the one who fears God shall not be moved. We will be everlasting in remembrance. We will not be afraid of evil tidings. Our heart is fixed. It's set upon trusting in, in God. And thus our heart is established. We shall not be afraid. Again, you tie this in with Hebrews 13 and verse 6. The Lord is my helper. God is our helper. 
when we tr show that respect for him, we can have that confidence that the Lord is my help helper and I shall not fear what man may do to me. Isn't that a comforting, isn't that an encouraging thought? In a world of instability, knowing that in God, that if we fear God as we ought to, that we can find true peace, true happiness, not only that, it prolongs our days. Ver verse number 2. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. And again, Peter talks about this as well in 1 Peter chapter 3, 12, and 12 through 15. He that would love life and see good days is the one who eschews evil, shuns it. And that's the one who fears God. Reverence produces spiritual wealth. Ver verse number th three, wealth and riches shall be in his house. Is it physical riches? Well, no. Notice 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Well, why is that? Because we are laying up for ourselves. The ones who fear God are the ones who are laying up for themselves treasures in heaven rather than on earth. You think about the foolish man in Luke chapter 12, that rich farmer. Where was his heart? Where were his treasures? Were they not on earth? He wanted to tear down his barns and build even bigger ones. He, had, he was guilty of covetousness. He found no true lasting happiness. He wanted more and more and more. But in God, when we fear God, we're going to truly be blessed. We're going to find true happiness. We're going to have that stability of life. Because, and we're going to be wealthy, spiritually wealthy. As Christians tonight, I suggest to you that we're the richest people on earth. Now, how is that? I'm not talking about monetarily. I'm talking about in Christ. Ephesians 1, verse 3. We enjoy all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Think about the blessings. If that doesn't make us the richest people on earth, I don't know what will. And thus we can find contentment. And when we have that contentment coupled with godliness, great gain. That's what our reverence for God produces. That's what it rewards us with. Not only that, it prevents, us, prevents evil living. Notice verse number 7. We're not going to be afraid of evil tidings. Well, why is that? Proverbs 8, 13 serves as a parallel text. Because when we fear God, we're going to hate those things which are evil. Why are so many given over to evil practices today? Because of a lack of fear for God, is it not? But yet the godly individual will shun evil. It produces peace, as we've already made mention of. Verse, verse number 8 of Psalm number 112. Also, obviously, produces humility in us because we recognize ourselves for who we truly are. That God is our creator. We are the created. Proverbs 15, verse 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. You think about King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. You think about what happened to him. He was lifted up with pride. But what happened to him? God drove him from the throne. Why did he come to recognize that there is a God in heaven and that he is able to abase all those who exalt themselves, but yet also recognize what Nebuchadnezzar also said? He, is able to, he will exalt those who do what? Abase or, or who humble themselves before God. You see, if we fear God, we're going to humble ourselves before Him. And when we do that in due time, He's going to lift us up. He'll exalt us. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what it takes to enter the, the kingdom, is it not? That's what it takes to obey the gospel, is it not? It's humility, emptying oneself of pride, recognizing oneself for who we truly are recognizing that we are in sin and that we need salvation from sin and only God can provide through and in Christ Jesus. Hence, ultimately, 
It produces forgiveness. Proverbs 16, 6. Fear of the Lord is that which enables us to depart from evil. It is that which enables us to die to sin. It is by mercy and truth iniquity is atoned for. That's the importance of reverencing God. That, that's the rewards for reverencing God. We need to understand that reverence for God is not an optional matter. It's not something that maybe I'll, maybe I'll reverence God, you know, maybe I, I can choose to reverence Him or not. No, no, no. It's an obligational matter. All should and must revere God. Psalm 33, verse number 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all inhabitants stand in awe before Him. If we are to be pleasing to God, and we must, if we are to make heaven our home in the hereafter, our pathway to heaven, our journey begins by showing respect, reverence, and awe for God and His holy word. God's desire is for the salvation of all mankind. We understand that. That's His desire. God would have all men to be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. God is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But sadly, the majority will be lost and will reject the gracious provisions for salvation made available by God simply because they do not respect God. They do not reverence Him. They do not want to show awe. They do not want to humble themselves before Him. And that is foundational in keeping His commands, as we've pointed out. Reverence for God is that crucial. It is that critical of a matter. It is essential if we want salvation from sin. Keeping His commandments, obeying His will, begins tonight with fearing Him. Tonight, if you're here, you're not a child of God. You have to ask yourself this question. Do I fear God? Do I fear God? Do I respect Him enough to give my life to Him? Am I willing to turn from sin? Am I willing to, to do what He says, to submit my life to His will, knowing that He is a good God and a gracious God and that He desires what is best for me? Am I willing to die to sin tonight? If you are, you know what you need to do. Having heard the word and believed it, turn from sin. Repent. Confess your faith in Christ and be buried with Him tonight in baptism. You can do that. You can go on your way rejoicing this evening as the Ethiopian eunuch did. We plead with you to do that tonight. However, as a child of God, is, are you living that life that shows reverence, respect for God? Are you continuing to live in accordance to His will? If so, keep on keeping on. However... If you've allowed sin back into your life, you need to take care of it. Because your sin shows a lack of respect for God's will. Rededicate your life to Christ this evening. Repent. Confess your sins. Pray to God for forgiveness. And I remind you once again, He is faithful and just to forgive you. Because He wants you to be forgiven. But you have to make the choice to be forgiven. And you make that choice by coming to Him on His terms. He invites you to come. The question is, will you accept His invitation right now as together we stand, as we sing?